let's start with perhaps the greatest figure in all of philosophy, that of Socrates. Socrates seems in his life to bridge this gap between the spirit and the intellect, and many, most people would agree that he is one of, if not the greatest philosopher, and, and yet he never left any writings whatsoever. Well, he was a philosopher in the original sense of the term, which is a lover of wisdom. That's what the word means, to love, to seek wisdom. And wisdom is not just something in the head. Wisdom is a state of the whole human being. A person who's wise, who not only knows the truth, but can live it. So the philosopher as Socrates was, was someone who seeks to be wisdom, not simply to know facts and propositions and ideas. He was a teacher of wisdom in that sense, a seeker. One has the sense, and I imagine you feel this quite acutely yourself, that contemporary philosophy, academic philosophy, has, has deviated a great deal from the path that was set down by the ancient philosophers such as Socrates. The whole culture has deviated from that. We, we've all deviated from that. We're, the whole modern culture tempts us and draws us into just one part of ourselves. And Socrates and Plato after him taught that only the completely integrated being is a true human being. So yes, academic philosophy has deviated from that, uh, but almost all of our lives we no longer have that in our hands. And if our culture as a whole is really moved away from this sense of being whole people, then, then I guess we have to look at, at alternatives to mainstream culture, to the esoteric or to counterculture examples perhaps which I know you've explored mm -hmm. extensively to, to get a handle on, on what was once mainstream ancient wisdom. Yes, uh, we have to look. Many people are looking mm -hmm. and many things are breaking through that yeah. we didn't know about or didn't take seriously before from ancient times, from the East, from God knows where. This seems to be a time when everything is pouring in mm -hmm. and certainly we need some new life uh, new understanding in our culture. Uh -huh. Well, wh what is your sense, if I can put the question to you directly? You're a professor of psychology. You philosophy. speak philosophy. Professor of philosophy. Yes. I'm sorry, sorry. my mistake. Sorry. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> You're a professor of philosophy, but you speak to many groups. You speak to physicians. You speak to uh, people in many different communities, students, uh, amongst others. How can you communicate this sense to people of, of what philosophy yes. is? I tell you, it's a very strange thing, and it may sound sort of uh, maybe even obvious, but I don't think it is. And I've discovered it in my work with groups like you mentioned, doctors, business people, psychologists, religious educators, young people. Real inquiry is a tremendous moral transforming force, and that's what Socrates was. He was inquiring, uh, searching, questioning. And he knew how to do that. It's not just questioning and looking for a quick answer or an explanation, but that the process of inquiry, of questioning, of opening, is open something in the human being which has not been touched in our culture. So it's, it's really, it's not a question of whether you're in this field or that field. Everybody who is human has in themselves a potential of a passionate inquiry after truth. And that's the transforming force. Mm -hmm. Now that's what I'm doing, and no matter where I am. You know, it may have been a bit serendipitous that I referred to you as a psychologist, because it seems as if what you're really talking about is, is the, the psyche itself, the ancient, which is absolutely refers well, to the, the soul. It was never separate. Philosophy and mm -hmm. psychology were always together. Yeah. And it's only a modern thing in our culture that there's been a separation between the search for wisdom and transcendence and the study of the mind, one's own mind, and all its possibilities, not just the pathology. So uh, it's true, it's the 20th century is the time when philosophy, psychology got separated off, but it never was that in the past. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I think I would like to think of myself as uh, trying to be a psychologist in the ancient sense as well as a philosopher. Mm -hmm. When we deal with the realm of, of the intellect, with the realm of, of concepts, you, you've introduced a very interesting distinction I'd like to bring up, and that is the difference between a concept and an idea. That's a t 
tough one, and it took me a lot in my book to it, explain it. It meant a lot to me when I yes, read it. it. It's hard to put it in a quick uh, description. A concept is a kind of mental tool of organizing data and facts, and uh, it's, it's kind of like a computer, uh, an aspect of a computer or a filing system, and very useful. But it's part <coughs> of a rather automatic part of the mind, which the human being has, and is very useful. An idea is like an expression of a fundamental reality, uh, a force, in a way. And it takes, sometimes its expression is in words, in abstract formula, formula, and sometimes it's in images, sometimes it's in geometric forms, in art forms. So the, the, cons the, the verbal expression of ideas is only one way of communicating something, of speaking about something that goes beyond the, uh, just the isolated intellect to understand. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to put this quickly in any other way, but ideas come from a deeper level of the human mind. Concepts are the ordinary mind functioning as it should to organize, cut, dry, put in file cabinets, and, and do all that. In other words, normally when we think of you know, the work of the intellect, we're thinking about concepts yes. that it deals with. Ideas is something that the intellect is also engaged, yes. engaged yes. in, but ideas, they penetrate deeper. They deeper, have a absolutely. greater transformative power. Absolutely. They're meant to go to, to be accepted by the intellect, but they need to penetrate mm -hmm. down into the heart and the guts, mm -hmm. and that's uh, what cons concepts don't do mm -hmm. particularly. And ideas, I suppose, are, are not measurable in the way that concepts are. They can't be manipulated the way concepts are no, manipulated. No, no. If like, they are, they get uh, twisted. A great idea might be what the one that's been left to us by Socrates, man, know thyself. That's a great idea. And many uh -huh. of those kinds of things. The idea of even what we're all familiar with, the idea of God, it's an idea. Uh, it points to something that may or may not exist. I think it does, what's real, but it's an idea. It didn't just appear automatically like somebody's, like a rock or a stone. Somebody had this vision of the idea of God or the idea of, uh, of the universe, of a oneness uh, in many in one, or in the ancient Chinese, the idea of the yin and the yang, the two, the, the, the constant interplay of two forces in the universe. This is an idea, mm. and the, now the head can figure out the conceptual way of doing it, but it can never really understand it because with ideas to understand it, you have to experience it. That means you have to in, be immersed in it with your whole being. Mm -hmm. So it's very big difference, ideas. And you're right, there's been a tremendous confusion between ideas and concepts. And therefore the conceptual <coughs> mind has tried to do all by itself, what only the whole, the mind of the whole person is able to do, and that's been a problem with our whole society, I think. Mm -hmm.